online, welcome, welcome, welcome. We are so glad that you have uh, decided to join us today in our time of worship and teaching. And I hope and pray that as we go through this service today, God will encourage you, uh, God will bless you, God will speak to you, and uh, when the service is over, uh, you'll be glad uh, that you joined us. As we crank into a new season, as we move into uh, the fall season, uh, things are going to be changing a little bit in your world with all the back to school and, and all the fall things that are going to begin to take place. But what's not changing is our commitment to you, uh, even though you are a part of our online congregation, our online family. And as we say every week, as we get ready to move into our time of worship, we want you to do your best to stay connected to us. Contact us. Let us know that you're part of our online congregation. And we'll do our best uh, to minister to you, to encourage you, to pray for you, uh, to bless you as we share together in, in this time uh, of, of worship and trusting Christ with all that we have. So you make sure that you do that. Find whatever way you can to connect with us and let us know that you're watching and let us know that you're a part of our family. Uh, before our service ends today, take a moment, if you will, and uh, uh, remember the great sacrifice that Jesus has made for us. Uh, in our on, uh, live services, we take communion together. We would love for you to share in that as well. Find a piece of uh, bread, find a cup of juice, and take some time to reflect upon what Jesus has done for you. And then we wanna encourage you to be a part of our ministry as a financial steward as well. Uh, you can give online, you can go to our website and find the information about that, but we greatly appreciate uh, your engagement. Wherever you are in this area, in this region, or in this world, uh, we're grateful that you're a part of our online family. Yeah, let me pray, and then we want you to enjoy this service. Would you bow your heads? Lord, as we come to you today, as we move into a time of worship, God, we pray that you'll be glorified, you'll be blessed, and that God, uh, through the words of songs, through the words of the message, that God, you'll speak to us, that we might be the kind of people that you want us to be. So use this service for your grace and for your glory. In Jesus we pray, amen and amen. Enjoy the service today.
Among my many interests in this life is reading. According to research, I am not alone in this interest. In fact, the results of a Pew Research report says that 80% of Americans, 16 and older, read at least occasionally for pleasure. 78% say they read at least occasionally to keep up with current events. 74% say that they read at least occasionally in order to do research on a specific topic that interests them. And 56% say that they read at least occasionally for work or school. Americans cite a variety of motives for their reading, especially when it comes to long-form content like books or magazine articles. But regardless of their reason and their style of interest, many people like to read. My mom was always glad about this because she was so upset that my first grade teacher, Mrs. Reinbold, Bucci Reinbold was her name, she didn't teach me how to read in the first grade. So upset was she that she pulled me out of the tiny country school, New Hebron School, where I attended first grade, and put me into second grade in the local town school, where I was then placed in a remedial reading class, and within a few months, I was up to speed. I don't know what kind of books you like to read, but but I'm a fan of James Bond-esque CIA kind of novels and, and law kind of novels like John, the John Grisham books. I love historical fiction like what Steve Barry writes and lighter sci-fi stuff that Dan Brown writes. And I also love biographies. And, and, and autobiographies. I, I devoured the book that Bob Iger wrote about his life and a career with Disney. I, I, I love the, 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 the biography of Dietrich Bonhoeffer by Eric Metaxas. And, and I recently finished the autobiography of Prince Harry entitled Spare, a book that Malcolm Gladwell wrote called The Bomber Mafia was intriguing. And The Boys in the Boat by Daniel James Brown about the University of Washington rowing crew winning the 1936 Olympic gold medal was fascinating. I would say that that I prefer fiction over anything else, but I love the other stuff for sure, and I'm quite an avid reader. I used to think it funny when someone young would write an autobiography. I mean, how can you write uh, the story of your life when you're not finished living it? Like Miley Cyrus, she wrote her autobiography at the ripe old age of 16. Think about that for just a couple moments. How much life have you lived by 16? Enough to write a book about? Well, Miley had, evidently. By this age, she was already a huge star on the Disney Channel comedy series called Hannah Montana, a show that for a while was the highest rated TV show on cable television. She was already a chart-topping singer selling millions of records. In fact, Ticketmaster agents said her concerts drew crowds with similar intensity to the Beatles and to Elvis. That same year her autobiography was published, Miley also was starring in the Hannah Montana movie, another big success. Something that you might find interesting about Miley, in 2001, when she was eight years old, her dad, country singer Billy Ray Silas, remember achy, breaky heart fame, right? He took her to see the stage show, Mama Mia. And it was after seeing that show that she decided that she wanted to be an actress and she wanted to be a singer. Miley wrote in her autobiography so her fans could, or she wrote her autobiography so her fans could feel closer to her, and she called her book Miles to Go. She knew the story of her life wasn't complete because she was still living it, but, but she had lived so much already. She says in her book, people ask if I'm missing out on a normal childhood. Sure, there are days when I don't get enough sleep and the set feels like a prison. My my parents talk about the day when this all slows down, but, but I know I'm blessed for this moment. Miley, you see, was recording the blessings of the moment to share with the world. Well, just for the record, in case you're wondering, I did not read Miley Cyrus's autobiography. But I have read the book of Acts dozens and dozens and dozens of times, and I get a sense that each time I read this incredible Bible history book, that that, that that is exactly what Luke was doing. He was recording the blessings of the moment to share with the world. 
The book of Acts isn't an autobiography of Paul, though it may seem like it. It's actually the story of of the Holy Spirit and the spread of the gospel. But if it were an autobiography, it feels unfinished. I mean, did did Paul stay in Rome? Did did Paul go to Spain as he had hoped? And he wrote about it in, in Romans chapter 15 and verse 28. It may be that Luke, the writer of the book of Acts, didn't include more because he was not an eyewitness to what happened next. I mean, up until this point, Luke had been traveling with Paul. Maybe like Maybe Luke, I should say, maybe Luke, like Miley, like Miley, realized that so much had already happened that he needed to capture it all right then. Can you imagine being Luke at this point, looking back? I mean, his gospel begins before Jesus is born, all the way back to the angel's prophecy to Zechariah and to Mary announcing the birth of the Messiah. Luke's gospel tells the story of Jesus, and then the book of Acts carries on the spread of the gospel. By the end of Acts, the the gospel has gone all the way from Jerusalem uh, to Rome, despite persecution and imprisonment, despite a 14-day storm and a shipwreck, and so much more. Despite so much intimidation and harassment and tyranny, God answered that now what question that the first century followers were asking. And he answered it, and he answered it with the creation and the beginning of the church. And for 28 chapters now and 13 Sundays, we have been looking at and studying this story. Unlike a book, however, while the last chapter ends, The story continues. Like an autobiography of a person who is still alive, the story goes on. Thus, while our series for the book of Acts ends today, the story of our ministry continues as we seek to remain being the church that Christ died for, the church that Christ started, the church that Christ developed. Today I want to explore a concept that goes beyond the pages of the New Testament, something that I like to call, and many other people like to call, Acts 29. While Acts 28 marks the end of the book of Acts, it doesn't mark the end of God's work in our lives and in this world. Acts 29 represents the ongoing story of God's work through us, His church, as we carry the torch of the gospel forward. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus declared, remember, he said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. As we've seen then, Acts 1 through chapter 28 chronicles the early church's journey from Jerusalem to what was at that time the ends of the known world. But what comes next? Well, I think Acts 29 begins with us. In our communities, in our neighborhoods, in our spheres of influence. Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 7, he stated, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Friends, we are called to finish the unfinished work. We talked about this last week, finishing the opera, finishing the story, right? We inherit the mission of the apostles to make disciples of all nations, to love our neighbors as ourselves, and to seek justice and mercy. The baton, the torch, has been passed to us, and we must run the race with perseverance. The book of Acts is filled with accounts of ordinary people doing extraordinary things through the power of the Holy Spirit. Acts 29, then, is is no different. God continues, listen, he continues to use ordinary individuals like you and me to heal the sick and comfort the brokenhearted and share the message of hope. We are vessels for his extraordinary work. And to be a part of Acts 29, we must walk in the Spirit daily. Galatians 5.25 tells us that since we live by the Spirit, what does it say? Look at the screen. Let us keep in step with the Spirit. We must pray for God's guidance, discern his will, act in obedience. The Holy Spirit empowers us to finish God's work with love and compassion and humility. Finally, Acts 29 is is not just about what we do, but how we live. You see, our lives are living testimonies of God's work, and people should see Christ in us, our actions, our our words, and our love for one another. Acts 29, then, is about leaving a legacy of faith that continues to inspire and transform future generations. And so the question of the day is this. 
Are you carrying the torch for Christ so that people might see him illuminated in a dark world? I want to ask that question again because it's really key. Are you carrying the torch for Christ so that people might see him illuminated in this darkened world? Are you living a story that people would want to read about? Whenever I think of carrying the torch, it seems that my mind often drifts to the images of seeing the Olympic torch being run across the country into the enormous Olympic stadiums. You, you want to talk about a fascinating story, uh, uh, of, of fascinating tradition, deeply rooted in the history of the Olympic Games. Here, here's, a little, here's a little overview of how this typically unfolds. You, you may know this part of the story, right? The journey of the Olympic flame begins with the lighting of the flame in Olympia, Greece. And this event takes place several months before the opening of the Olympic Games, and a person uses a parabolic mirror to focus the sun's rays and ignite the flame using the power of the sun, symbolizing purity and the connection between the games and ancient Greece. Once the flame is lit, it's transferred to a torch, and that first torchbearer, often an accomplished athlete or notable figure, carries the lit torch from the ancient site of Olympia, and this signifies the beginning of the Olympic torch relay. The flame is then carried across the host country, typically traveling through various cities and towns and regions, and along the way, the torch is carried by a diverse group of torch bearers, including athletes and celebrities and and community leaders, but often it's also carried by ordinary citizens. Ordinary people, ordinary citizens who are just nominated for their, their contributions to society. The Olympic torch is, relay is, it's not just a journey, it, it's a symbol of unity and peace. It's an opportunity for, for people from different regions and different backgrounds to come together in celebration of the Olympic spirit. It often involves cultural events and festivities and celebrations at various stops along the route. The torch relay culminates at the Olympic stadium during the opening ceremony of the Games. And the final torchbearer, often a respected athlete or or a significant figure, enters the stadium and uses the Olympic flame to light the cauldron. This moment is one of great significance, and it marks the official start of the Olympic Games. One cool story, of course, you might remember this here in the U.S., is when Muhammad Ali lit the flame to start the 1996 Games in Atlanta, And for the first time, he shared with the world his bout with Parkinson's disease. Once the Olympic flame is lit, it continues to burn throughout the duration of the games, right? And it symbolizes the spirit of competition and excellence and international cooperation. The flame is then extinguished during the closing ceremony, signifying the end of the games, Let this image flood your mind. Let this image flood your thoughts right now. I want you to see this with me, right? Uh, As you live your story of Christ, friends, we carry the torch for Jesus. My message last week was all about finishing the work. Remember that? This, This torch symbolizes the gospel of Jesus Christ, the message of salvation, new life. It's a torch that has been passed down through the generations, from the apostles to faithful believers throughout history. It's been carried to every nation, and nearly every person has seen the light that comes from it. Listen, today, this torch is in your hands. Just as in a relay race, the gospel has been passed down from one generation to the next, we are not the starting point, nor are we the finish line. We are participants in this relay race of faith. Hebrews 12.1 encourages us to run the race with perseverance, the race marked out for us. Our faith journey is enriched when we look back and we learn from those who have carried the torch before us. The heroes of faith mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11 reminds us that of these remarkable individuals, some of them quite ordinary, right, who ran their leg of the race with faith and endurance and unwavering trust in God. And now, listen, 
we have the responsibility to pass the torch to the next generation as mentors and parents and leaders. We must invest in the faith development of our youth. We are called to equip them to carry the torch with courage and conviction and with passion. And to be sure, catch this. As torchbearers, we have a critical role to play, right? We are called to share the gospel with those who have yet to hear it. Romans 10, 14 says, how can they, how then can they call on the one that they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? We carry the torch. We carry the torch so that others may see the light. Our journey as torchbearers is, is, is part of the ongoing story of God's work in the world. Every person who comes to faith, every life transformed by grace, every act of love and compassion, all of these are chapters in this magnificent narrative. And as we conclude the summer series of messages today, remember that Acts 29 is not a mere chapter in a book. It's the ongoing story of God's work through his people. We are the living culmination of the book of Acts. And so let's embrace this mission. Finish the unfinished work. Be vessels of God's ordinary grace. May Acts 29 be written in our lives as we move forward in faith, believing that God's work is far from finished. We, you see, carry the torch, and we pass the torch to the next person. Speaking of stories, can I close with some stories of, of some torch bearers? Listen to just a snippet. Be, be inspired to go learn more. Be, be stirred to go do your part. Maybe you've heard of Adoniram and Ann Judson. At the age of 25, Adoniram Judson was the first American missionary to Burma. He and Anne had been married for two weeks before they boarded a ship bound for India, uh, from which they eventually were able to make their way to Burma. Uh, Judson would spend the next nearly 40 years of his life living among and witnessing to the Burmese people. And until her death, Anne was the friend of many and even more fluent in the Burmese language than her academically inclined husband. Judson's efforts were slow going. He was imprisoned and tortured, however, but he never gave up on his God-given calling to reach Burma for Jesus. And before his death, Adoniram Judson had not only established several churches in Burma, but he had also given Burma one of the greatest gifts, the Bible in their own language. How about the story of Dr. David Livingston? As a child, he worked in the cotton mills to help support his poverty-stricken family. David Livingston learned, the perseverance, uh, learned perseverance and went on to put himself through medical school and become a doctor before following in the footsteps of Robert Moffat and going to Africa as a doctor and a missionary. He was a missionary, ex explorer, champion of the anti-slavery slavery movement. Dr. Livingston used his influence and experience to fight great wrongs in the society of his day and to blaze a path for other missionaries to follow in the villages that he went to. He believed that he was not called to preaching as much as he was called to fi finding routes and resources for trade that would displace the profit in slave trading and work tirelessly towards this end. He was loved by many and respected by the tribes to whom he made contact with. How about the story of Mary Slessor? Growing up in the slums of Aberdeen, Scotland with an alcoholic father and a little hope of changing your circumstances doesn't seem like a promising start for anybody. But for Mary Slessor, her childhood taught her a tenacity and a strength that would serve her well for spending years in Nigeria. Mary grew up hearing her devout mother read the mission paper every month, and in her heart grew a desire to share Jesus with others. She was 27 when David Livingston passed away, and she decided that she would go and continue his work to reach all of Africa. Mary's work began in Calabar, and she lived and worked in places where no European had ever been. She faced life-threatening illnesses and hardship, but mighty Mary, as they called her, did not once consider giving up. She lived with Okoyong and Ethic people for 15 years, learning their languages, helping them settle disputes, working tirelessly to educate and overcome superstitions such as twin killing and women's rights. She earned their love and respect, and as a result, was able to spin, spread the gospel to areas that no other missionary could. Maybe you've heard of J. Hudson Taylor. 
For 51 years, J. Hudson Taylor poured his life into bringing Christ behind the closed doors of China. He founded the China Inland Mission, and as a result, more than 800 missionaries were brought into the country. Hudson Taylor was a prayer warrior and a faith giant. He was able to speak several Chinese dialects and helped to translate the New Testament into the dialect used in Shanghai, where he spent many years of his life. Unlike many European missionaries, Taylor was careful of Chinese culture, respecting their way of life, even adopting their clothing. He faced sickness and loss with a spirit of unshaken trust, leaving behind a legacy that has inspired thousands of missionaries in all corners of the world. In his own words, he said, all God's giants have been weak men who did mighty and great things for God because they reckoned on his being with them. Maybe you've heard of Amy Carmichael. Amy Carmichael, perhaps not many people thought that Amy Carmichael would ha- had much of a chance at being a missionary, suffering from neurology. Uh, Amy was often weak and in pain so great that she was compi- confined to bed for weeks at a time. But Amy knew that God had called her to mission work, and with the encouragement of a few, she did go. In India, she found her life calling, and she spent her remaining 55 years there without ever coming and going home. Her life was dedicated to ending child prostitution, giving a home and a future to India's many orphans, and was a prolific writer, and many of her books have encouraged and inspired many throughout the years. Maybe you've heard of Eric Liddell. Eric Liddell was a successful athlete But fame and honor didn't sway him uh, from what he knew was his life calling to preach the gospel in China. Eric was born in China to missionary parents. He attended the school in London where he trained and became known for his athletic abilities. In fact, he went on to compete in the Olympics but remained true to his convictions. In 1925, Eric returned to China And he used his skills to minister and influence many young Chinese for Christ. He was captured by the Japanese during World War II, and he passed away of an inoperable brain tumor during his imprisonment. His death left a great empty place in the lives and hearts of many people who had spent his life, who who, who had spent his life serving. His final written words were this, it's complete surrender. Now, I could go on and on and on, friends. I could go on and on and on, right? Telling story after story of of, of ordinary people, ordinary people who simply live their lives seeking to be obedient to God. And as I just read a a few of them, many of their stories are are fascinating. I grew up on a steady diet of missionary stories. I mean, we regularly, I've talked about this before, we had regular missionaries coming and visiting our home as they traveled uh, the country visiting churches. And it was just a given. It was just a given that we would turn off the television and we would come in and visit with our missionary friends who were faithfully serving the Lord across the world. What impact did that have on me? Well, to put it bluntly, it helped me see that I was, some, I was a part of something much bigger than myself. Indeed, we are a part of something much bigger than ourselves. We are a part of the ongoing story of God's work through His church. We are the torchbearers entrusted with carrying the flame, the, the flame of the gospel. We are entrusted to carry it forward. So friends, listen, let us run the leg of our race with endurance, passing the torch to the next generation, keeping the flame alive. Together, we continue God's work in this world. And may the torch of the gospel burn brightly in our lives, illuminating the path that others might find their way to Jesus. So a couple of songs today you probably won't recognize, and that's because they're original songs, and this particular one, um, I wrote over the last couple of weeks, and I just want to share it with you guys. I feel like it's a good song for us to sing as a church, so we're going to sing it together today. I'm in unknown waters, I can't see 
past the waves I want to have faith like Peter Lord, I'm afraid I'll sing Faith like a mustard seed Is quite frankly hard to believe I know your ways are better Than I could ever dream Take my life as a living sacrifice Lay me down at your feet Have your way I give you all of me You are the hope that I speak of crucifixion will you say follow me the act of dying counters the mind and body's will to breathe take up my cross deny myself and I will gain life is found in losing it all for Jesus' sake take through the seasons the tempest and the calm I'll never stop leaning on your edge.